I'm Associate Professor for International Relations at the University of Innsbruck. And my research focus is on, on foreign and security policy, um, a little bit of counterterrorism, uh, especially in, in, in the US, Europe, and Austria. And I also do some research on social science research methods, academic writing and presentation, and on open and reproducible science. And that's the reason why I'm here today. Uh, if you want to learn more about me or get into uh, contact with me, just check my website, write me an email, or check my uh, um, uh, social accounts at Mastodon or Blue Sky. Of course, there's also some sort of commercial break, and we start with the commercial break. Uh, I'm part of the Foreign Policy Lab, um, uh, um, an institution that, that seeks to further foreign security policy analysis, especially with a focus on Austria. So when, when you want to learn more about this, just check our website. And I'm also part of the Austrian Foreign Policy Panel Project, which is a data set uh, that deals with attitudes of Austrians when it comes to foreign and security policy. So also check this one if you're interested in, 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 in this or other topics. And last but not least, there's AUSTA. I'm part of the uh, AUSTA board, which is the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. And that's also the reason why I came to the topics or I, I have a focus on open science and reproducible research. And for today's webinar, we will uh, use one of these uh, data sets for, uh, of AUSTA to show you how to do a graph. So, um, Please, for all, for all those who, who uh, just came into the room, turn off your camera because the, the um, webinar will be recorded. Um, so what's the, how, what's the structure, sorry? Um, what's the structure of this, of this um, webinar? Um, this webinar will take about 19 minutes. And we start with a theoretical uh, a part where we where will um, talk about what, um, what is a visualization. So what are the basic concepts of visualizing um, data? Then we'll talk about the process. So how do you come from your idea to the final result? So the process of data visualization. And then I'm gonna show you the tools that we need to do visualizations. And that is uh, our studio or two Python notebook and ggplot2. And finally, I will show you, I will show you uh, an example, an example taking from a data set from the European Values Study, uh, where we focus on the topic of diversity, which is one of the core topics of the Infra for Next Generation uh, project. Before I start with what is a visualization, let me recommend to you two books. And these two books are um, uh, really, really uh, the go-to books uh, if you want to learn more about data visualization and ggplot2. There's on one side, this book of uh, Jonathan Schwabisch, uh, Better Data Visualization. And it's really, really one of the best books I ever came across uh, on this topic. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the uh, examples I use here in this presentations are drawn from this book. So please have a look at it if you want to dive deeper into this um, um, topic. And the second book is the book of uh, Hedley Wickham, GGBot 2, Elegant Graphics for Data and, uh, Analysis. That's the standard book for GGBot 2. And it's online available as an open source uh, book. So please check this one too. So um, enough about uh, uh, the structure and uh, book recommendations. Let's go into um, the first part. So what is a visualization? Let's dive into this topic. And I will start with the definition by Cairo, which is another great uh, author on this uh, topic. And Cairo defines a, a visualization as any kind of visual representation of information designed to enable communication, analysis, discovery, exploration, and so on. So basically this um, this the definition consists of two elements. Uh, visualization is basically a visual representation of reality. So it's an abstract model of reality. And the second element is um, it's, um, it's um, um, you do visualizations in order to communicate research results, research insights. For example, let me show you this um, visualization, a visualization taken from um, Nate Silver, the famous statistician uh, uh, in the US um, who um, um, shows us with this visualization how the, the polls in the United States projected who will win the presidential election. So basically it's 
some sort of visual re representation of uh, uh, public attitudes towards these two candidates, and, and it seeks to communicate um, uh, who's ahead in this race. What is important in this context is we do not just look at visualizations, we do read visualizations. So reading a visualization is some sort of a cognitive process like reading a paragraph. It's not just something we look at, but something we try to understand and perceive, which will be something I will talk soon about. What we will not do in this webinar is an infographic, but I will give you also the definition of an infographic. An infographic is basically a multi-section visual representation of information intended to communicate one or more specific messages. So it's basically a collection of several graphs, uh, but we do not do, do this in, 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 the, um, um, in this webinar. But here's a very, very nice um, 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 infographics. As, uh, as far as I think, it's, it's uh, from the South China Morning Post about uh, whale hunting. And as you can see here, it's a collection of several different sorts of visualizations that in, in, in total tell a story. So let's talk about the purpose of visualizations. And we already touched it with the first definition. Um, Cairo argues that the purpose of infographics and data visualizations is to enlighten people to, and not to entertain them, not to sell them products or services or ideas, but to inform them. So basically this information element is the key element in the purpose of a visualization. And there are two key elements here. We already talked about it. It's communication on the one side. So it's about drawing and organizing lines and shapes to communicate a specific bit of science-related information to another person. And it is, and I really like this uh, um, definition um, very much. It's all about using imagery in the service of communication, as you can see here. And the second element is not just to communicate something, but also to increase the understanding of uh, uh, um, uh, research results. So data visualizations aims to facilitate understanding at the end of the day. And this understanding is a key element of data visualization. And as Kirk argues, there are three phases of understanding um, um, such a visualization. And we have to know how these phases work in order to, to um, 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 design good graphs. So first we have to perceive a picture, then we have to interpret the picture, and finally we have to comprehend what this picture is all about. So what's the story behind this picture we are uh, um, um, uh, viewing or perceiving. Let me give you a short example how this works. Take a look at this graph, for example, and make it a little bit taller. Uh, it's a basically a bar graph. Bar graphs, uh, I will talk about this later, is a, is a good way. It's, a, it's a, um, one of the most comprehensible graph types that we have, our chart, uh, chart types. And we can use it for showing the change of, of elements over time. So we can display change and the transformation of things. And this chart type somehow shows the total sightings of winglets and spangles. And as you can see here, and it's the preceding uh, uh, um, part of the element, we see here that um, um, there's an increase or there are winglets and there are spangles and there are uh, different heights of these uh, um, column bars. And when we try to interpret it, we can see, okay, at the beginning um, of this uh, chart uh, or of this time period, there were, there were more winglets, but then, but then the numbers of spangles also increased. But what about comprehending this graph? So think for, for yourself, what's the main message? What do you know after seeing this, this graph? So we perceive it. We somehow try to interpret it, seeing that, okay, there's an increase of winglets and, and, and there's also an in, in, increase of spangles after time, but what does that mean? The problem is, I don't think that any one of you knows what the winglets or spangles is. And that's the point, because we cannot comprehend this graph because we have no information what a winglet or a spangle is. And here's the solution of this problem. Of course, it's not about winglets and spangles, it's about the games and goals of Lionel Messi. For those of you who don't know Lionel Messi, it's the best football player the world has ever seen. So there's no question about that. And as you can see here, 
it's not about the winglets and spangles. It's about the games uh, Lionel Messi played for FC Barcelona and the goals he scored during these games. And as you can see here, at the beginning of his career, he played not that much, but then the numbers of games increased and also the number of goals. And as you can see here in the season 2011 and 12, 2012 and 13, he scored and even 14, 15 and 16, 17, he scored more goals than games he played and he played a lot of games. So as you can see here, that's, uh, um, that's a, a graph you really are able to not just perceive and somehow interpret, but also comprehend the main message of these um, graphics. So the point here is, viewers not always have the sufficient information for interpreting and comprehending and thereby understanding a graph. So it's up to you as a designer of uh, um, uh, such visualizations to think about the uh, uh, information necessary uh, for the viewers to understand um, a graph. So you have to uh, give the, the, the viewers those information that they need to perceive, to interpret, and to comprehend the graph at the end of the day. It also shows us that there's no such uh, thing as a standard graph, because every graph depends on the main message you want to communicate and the audience you are uh, trying to convince with your graph. And so every graph has somehow a different shape, a different design, and that's what we try to learn in this webinar. So what, is, uh, what are uh, criteria for good visualization? And um, they will cite the principal graphical, uh, the principles of graphical excellence of Tufti. Tufti is a political scientist who um, focused a lot of on, on, on graphics, on design, and who, who follows a philosophy of keep it short and keep it simple. And Tufti argues that graphical excellence is well-designed presentation of interesting data, a matter of substance, statistics, and of design. So we, uh, by, by, by doing a graph, we have to bring together all these elements. So um, substance, we have to say something with, with substance. We have to have good statistics. And of course, we have to think about design. It also argues that graphical excellence co consists of complex ideas communicated with clarity, precision, and efficiency. And I, and I think that's the main point uh, we, sh we should have in mind. Um, we use graphics to make complex ideas more uh, uh, easily to understand because we, we, we communicate it with clarity, precision, and efficiency. And the third element of uh, that Tufti cites, it's uh, um, um, some sort of the, the core of his, his uh, philosophy because he argues graphical excellence is that, what, uh, that which gives to the viewers the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in a smallest space. So it's, it's somehow a, a, a big, big challenge to somehow communicate as much as possible, but in the shortest way of time with the least ink possible and in the smallest space you have to, uh, uh, um, um, that is available, which is really, really a tough thing to do. And we will see if we uh, um, achieve this at the end of the day. There are also other um, elements that we have to have in mind when, it's, uh, when it comes to criteria of good data visualizations. And here I, I will quote uh, Cairo and Kirk and all these um, authors I mentioned here, you will find them at the uh, end of the um, presentation in the bibliography. And they basically argue that um, a good visualization is a truthful visualization. So, so always have in mind that you should not display a certain bias in your data or uh, uh, in your um, uh, graph, you should not somehow mislead viewers um, with your um, visualization. And here I also quote Ignacio and Klein, which wrote a, uh, a book on data feminism, arguing that um, a lot of troubles come with data itself because data is somehow biased because it just uh, um, uh, um, because the sample is biased, for, for example, if you have a sample just of men and not women, and then you uh, visualize uh, something and argue, okay, this is representative for all mankind, that's, uh, uh, of course, a bias. So be critical about the data sets you use and be also critical about um, um, the things you um, um, 
um, visualize at the end of the day because it will have an effect on the viewer. Second element, visualization should be functional and accessible. So it's your task to make uh, patterns visible and to allow people to make the rightful conclusion. So it's somehow linked to this truthfulness. The next element is uh, that um, visualization should be insightful and, and enlightening. So they should allow discoveries that would otherwise be invisible. So it's the task of you to make things visible that are not visible in the first place. And last, and that's also very important, they should be elegant and beautiful. So we, we do not do graphs that are um, bad looking because uh, the more beautiful a graph is, the more catchy it will be and the, uh, the better you will be able to communicate your research uh, results. Let me go on to the question of, or the problem of simplicity versus complexity, because as you already heard here, um, uh, following Tafti, good graphs are graphs that convey the greatest number of ideas in the shortest period of time with the least ink and in the smallest space. So it's somehow a trade-off between what you want to say as much as possible, but how you say it. So between simplicity and complexity. And as Cairo argues, any visualization at the end of the day is a model of reality. And it's up to you, it's your decision to decide how much of reality you want to show viewers and how abstract um, uh, visualization has to be that viewers at the end of the day uh, get the message right. And Cairo argues in this context that good models abstract reality while keeping its essence at the same time. The more adequately a model fits whatever it stands for without being needlessly complex, and the easier it is for its intended audience to interpret it correctly, the better it will be. So you always have to think about how much abstraction do you need and how close you have to be towards reality in order to convey the, 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 the most information, most of the information and the most exact way. Uh, uh, or the, 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 the exact parts of your information. Second, he also says simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. And as you will see in, the, uh, in my graph later on, we get rid of those elements that are not necessary for you to convey the main message. So get rid of, 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 of the noise and focus on the signal, um, uh, uh, on those elements that, that are really essential at the end of the day. Third, good visualization should not oversimplify information. They need to clarify it. So in many cases, clarifying a subject requires increasing the amount of information, not reducing it. And it's somehow a contradiction to the uh, principles before. So it's, it's, it's really this trade-off between simplicity and complexity because get rid of the noise and, and focus on the signal, but focusing on a signal sometimes means also adding more information and not reducing it. And the last element I, I, I or the last hint that uh, Cairo gives us is that simplicity isn't just about reduction. It can and should also be about augmentation. It consists of removing what isn't relevant from our models, but also of bringing in those elements that are essential to making those models truer. So sometimes we also have to think about how to uh, add elements to make things more visible or better visible that are so important for our main message. And one way of, 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 of uh, uh, doing this, uh, adding the meaningful and augment uh, to augment the important is the use of preemptive processing or the use of uh, preemptive attributes to be, to be uh, precise. So, we use preemptive attributes to direct observers' focus on special parts of our visualizations. And visualizations can not only be graphs, they can also be, for example, in this case, um, um, a table. Let's have a look at this table and ask our, um, uh, and let's ask the question, who of these guys sold most in which quarter? So take a short look at it and think for yourself, uh, who's the one who's leading the sales in uh, uh, the respective quarters. It's, it's not that difficult because the table is quite well designed for several reasons. I will not focus on the design of tables in this um, webinar, but 
it's something you have to invest some time because it's it's not obvious in the first place which one uh, uh, sold most in which quarter. So by the use of preemptive attributes, we can make things better readable in this case. Let's focus on this one. And as you can see here, we use, in this case, a color, a color red, uh, which is some sort of preemptive attribute. And you can instantly uh, recognize which one sold most in which quarter. It's Lauren with 98 uh, uh, million in Q1. It's Jack in Q2, it's Karen in Q3, and it's Bob in Q4. So it's quite easily uh, accessible here. You can make things even more readable, for example, if you do it this way. Here, we just uh, it's even better readable because we uh, um, used transparency or the saturation of a color to focus on, on, on uh, to bring those elements uh, to the foreground that are most important and to uh, take the other elements to the background. So what you should have uh, uh, learned from this chart is that we use colors, we use shapes, we use sizes, we use saturation and transparency and other elements to focus readers or viewers' attention to certain parts of uh, uh, a graph, okay? So what have we learned basically now um, um, in this first part in the theory part of this webinar? Uh, we use data visualizations to uh, communicate research results and to increase the understanding of viewers when it comes to uh, uh, the communication of our research results. Um, when we do some this when we design charts, we also always have in mind that it's it's this process of understanding is is a, a, a three way process of perceiving things, interpreting things, and comprehending things. And in order to do so, people or the viewers have to have certain informations in mind. Important um, good visualizations are those that uh, convey the greatest numbers of ideas of information in the shortest period period of time. And there is some sort of trade-off between the simplicity and the complexity of, of, of graphs. So it's about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. And adding the meaningful sometimes needs uh, uh, preemptive attributes so that uh, people can uh, um, um, uh, process this information right. Let's go on to the process of visualizing data. Are, are there any questions yet or something that is uh, 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 not understandable right now. We can discuss at the end of the webinar. There will be plenty of time, I hope. Um, but if there are, are ad hoc questions because you didn't understand elements, uh, just give me, let me know. Good, no questions, then go on. to Then we go on to the process of visualizing data. In order to visualizing data, we have to know the building blocks of visualizations. Um, Kirk argues that visual, visual representations involves making decisions about how you're going to portray your, portray your data visually so that the subject understanding it offers can be made accessible to your audience. In simple terms, this is all about charts and the act of selecting the right chart to show the features of your data that you think are most relevant. And there are plenty of different chart types we could talk about. I, I, I put these uh, chart types here in a graph. Let's make it a little bit uh, bigger, where you can see it always depends on which sort of data you have. Do you want to do some comparison? Do we talk about correlation? Do we talk about uh, uh, temporal uh, data, so data over time? It's about distribution, geospatial data, or whatever. There are certain chart types. And I will not be able to cover all these chart types and all these, these, these uh, uh, different ways of uh, displaying data, but there's the link in it and please have a look at it. And uh, again, this book of, of uh, um, Jonathan, Jonathan Schwabisch is really, really good because it shows you um, um, numerous chart types um, um, according to these different ways of uh, uh, data types. Basically, the building blocks of uh, graphs are marks and attributes. Marks are the elements that represent the items of data, that are the, the, the points, the columns, the lines that we see at the end of the day uh, in a chart. And we use the attributes, the thing we uh, talked uh, um, about, to represent certain values 
of this mark. So we use text, we use color, we use shape, we use size in order to, to uh, bring things forward or to give those points, column and lines some uh, uh, additional uh, um, um, values or to asso associate the, 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 um, um, these, these um, the data with these um, elements. And in order to, to do a graph, we, sorry, to do a graph, um, we have to understand the four phases of this visualization process as Kirk um, argues. The first thing we have to have, we have to have a concept. So we have to plan and define a project. We have to, we need a research question, something we want to find out. We have to have a research goal. After this, of course, that's uh, in, in this phase, we do not talk about graphs yet, but then uh, we somehow discover certain, uh, or we have certain um, results at the end of the day um, because we were looking at data so we have to gather data, we have to handle data, we, we have to prepare our data. And it's very, very important and that's something I just can recommend you. When you do data visualizations, get to know your data. Getting to know the data set is the most important thing before you start um, um, designing your data. And even then, when you already have a, uh, um, uh, some basic des design concept of this chart in your head, you have to know the data because programming only works when you know the basic structure of your data. And I will come to this a little bit later. So define a concept, plan your project, and then gather data in order to, to underline your basic uh, um, research results. And um, therefore you have to gather, handle, and prepare your data. The next step is editorial thinking. So think of, of what you will show your audience and um, what you want to communicate. So what's the main message? A graph is not just a nice thing to look at. Its basic purpose is to inform people. And informing people means you have to have something that is worth being communicated. So it's not something you use just to fill your pages in your book or your, your, your paper. It's something that you somehow choose because this element is so important uh, or, or maybe difficult to understand so that you use a visualization to make things uh, uh, um, more catchy or more comprehensible at the end of the day. And in order to do that, you have to have, you, you need to do editorial thinking, this, uh, defining what your audience sh should see and what your main uh, element of communication should be. And then there's the final phase, and that's uh, uh, um, after phase one, two, and three, which 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 will cost you a lot of uh, uh, energy and uh, um, um, knowledge and thinking. You go into the design phase, and here we'll focus on the recommendations by Schwabisch how to design a graph. And the first element that I will recommend you is show the data. Whenever you do a graph, show people the data because showing the data helps viewer better to better understand your argument. And that's not, that's not necessarily a contradiction to this principle of using less ink, because if you show data, you have to use more ink, but it's not about showing the least amount of data. It's, amount, it's, uh, um, it's about showing the data that matters most. And I give you exa uh, again this example of this, uh, 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 um, um, of the polling averages by Nate Silver. And as you can see here, we do not just have these uh, lines here, which indicate somehow the, the, the mean results. You also see the data in the background with a little bit of transparency. But as you can see here, there's a lot of noise in the data at the beginning. And then when it comes to the, uh, the closer it comes to uh, election date, the, the less noise there is, okay? So he really showed um, he shows viewers not just um, uh, the summary of this data, but also the data in itself, which is a, a fine way to do. Next element in the, in the design phase, reduce the, the clutter. So get rid of the unnecessary element elements and focus on the main message. And I'm going to give you one example of the, one of the worst graphs I ever came across. It's this one. It's really, really ugly for multiple reasons. And I hope you share this impression with me that uh, um, this is really ugly. 
Why is it ugly? Because you somehow portray a two-dimensional uh, two element in a three-dimensional way, which is totally unnecessary. So if you have two dimensions, don't use three dimensions to portray two dimensions. Even if you have three or more dimensions, there is no need for a three-dimensional graph. So it's 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 just uh, uh, a waste of time and a waste of ink to use 3D um, uh, graphs. Focus on the two-dimensional um, graphs and uh, do it the right way. Second, there is an excessive use of colors and of bad colors. So you have, as you can see here, there is a background color. There's no need for background color. And there is uh, um, the font color in yellow is also something you shouldn't do, uh, uh, at least not in, 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 uh, with this amount. And of course, there is the shading of the bars. The shading of the bars is, uh, it doesn't make things easier to comprehend and to, 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 to understand. So a much better graph would be just this graph. It's the same graph at the end of the day. It's the same information, but a totally different graph. As you can see here, there's no y-axis. There's no need for y-axis because you uh, label the, um, the bars directly. You have um, clear color, um, um, green and, and purple. You don't use uh, a, a background color. You have a clear title in, in, in this case. Yeah, it's, it's much better at the end of the day. So please reduce the clutter and focus on the essential elements of the graph and not about uh, uh, these noisy elements that you do not need to, to, to interpret and to comprehend the graph at the end of the day. Next, uh, integrate the graphics and the text because text and annotation help readers to increase the, uh, uh, or gives you the chance to increase the, read the readability of the graphs and, 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 and helps reader, readers and viewers to understand the graph much better. So that means remove legends if possible and label uh, data directly. Okay? It's not always the case, but uh, 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 most of the time it's a good thing to do. Um, write the titles like a newspaper headline. So um, of, it's something, it's, it's, it's not very common in, 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 in academia to use a fancy title, but fancy title doesn't mean that the things are uh, uh, not uh, scientific anymore. Sometimes using a fancy title increases the, read the readability of a graph. And third, add explainers. So if a graph is a little bit more complex, um, you shouldn't. Um, 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 you should somehow help readers to better read a graph in, uh, uh, when you add explainers, so that he or she is able to to get to the basics, to the basic message by just looking at the graph without additional uh, uh, text in your text. Let me give you three examples again. This uh, uh, bar graph from before, which is much better than the original version with a lot of clutter. But you can make things better here. For example, get rid of the of the uh, legend, as you can see here, by direct labeling. Okay, you, uh, you directly label it. But you can make things even better. For example, if you get rid of the labeling of the bars here and add this labeling directly in the in the headline, as you can see here, um, in the headline, it's average years of schooling in Germany, which is green, and the United States, which is purple. And there's, then there's this direct link between, between the uh, uh, headlines and the color of the headlines and the bars at the end, end of the day. So um, all these graphs are fine, totally fine. But the last graph is a graph that you, where you would say, okay, you follow these basic principles of integrating graphics and text. Next principle, avoid the spaghetti chart. Um, spaghetti chart is is is, is uh, somehow an expression for charts that try to con to 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 uh, communicate too much information for a chart. Sometimes it's it's too much information. And a spaghetti chart, I will show you one soon, is a chart with a lot of lines. And these uh, uh, lines make somehow the impression that it's uh, uh, um, 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 like a lot of spaghetti on um, uh, in in a place. And uh, in this case, use multiple panels or facets in order to portray your data uh, in a in a in a in a uh, better way. And 
Um, that's also something which is at the, uh, um, strange at the beginning. Start with gray. Do not start with colors at the beginning because colors are uh, preemptive attributes. You add the colors because you want to say something special. And so when you start with gray, you can then think about, okay, which parts of the graph need a color in order to convey my main message. Let me give you an example. That's a classical spaghetti chart, although it's fine, but, but, but there are a lot of lines. And as you can see here, it started with gray. It's quite difficult or it's impossible to distinguish uh, which line belongs to which state. So it's about the average school year, uh, years of schooling uh, around the world. Um, you have to add some sort of color in this case. And um, this chart shows you um, how it looks like if you add the colors. But again, it's, it's, it's really a spaghetti chart because it's too much information. Maybe you uh, uh, don't want to show users or uh, viewers um, uh, all of this uh, data, or, or maybe you want to show all of the data, but the important elements are not all states, but just two states. For example, when you just uh, write a paper about schooling years in the United States versus Germany, uh, it's maybe interesting to see how other states compare to the US and to Germany before, but the focus should be on these two states. It's quite easy to solve this problem with this one, okay? It's the same um, chart at the end of the day. You have the other countries for comparison also displayed. So the principle show your data is, is, is still valid here, but the focus is on the, on, on the United States and Germany. And you, you directly label these two elements so that um, 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 the focus is, is, is just on these two lines and not the other ones, okay? So that's a pretty easy way to focus the attention of, of viewers on those elements that are most important. As you can see here, uh, there's also a, a, a special headline um, um, focusing on these two um, um, states. So Germany and the United States have the highest average years of completed schooling. Okay. Um, I see there are some questions in the chat. Is, uh, is there a need to, to address these questions or should we go on? Um, I think one is um, a very good um, addition. Um, it's um, about choosing colors, um, thinking about possible colorblind readers. So, yes. yes. Yeah. I will. I will not cover. I will not cover the the, the topic of of colorblindness. But there's uh, um, um, uh, in the book of Schwabisch there's a uh, chapter on this topic. Uh, a certain number of people around the world do have uh, color blindness or, or um, um, color deficiencies. So um, they have trouble in perceiving colors in different ways, okay? So when you use colors, there are, and I can add this, this element in, in, um, in the presentation that we will give you at the end, um, there are some certain packages or certain color palettes that uh, take care of this problem that just give you those uh, colors that are really um, 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 uh, where people with color deficiencies can uh, handle it. So um, I will not uh, talk about this uh, topic, but I will give you a link to a website that uh, gives you some sort of, of, of uh, um, good colors for colorblind people. Okay, fine. So that's the process of um, doing visualizations. Let's talk about the tools, how to do it. And I, uh, we, we, we promoted this webinar uh, with, um, uh, um, or we, we promised you that we will show you how to do it in our studio in Jupyter and ggplot2. Um, there's no big difference between our studio and Jupyter at the end of the day when it comes to, to uh, doing a ggplot2 graph. So I will show you um, um, in um, this presentation, how I did it with R Studio, and but it, it I, I also checked it with Jupyter Notebook. It's just a copy and paste thing, and it works fine in Jupyter Notebook. But it it looks a little bit nicer, at least for this presentation, if I show you the output and the input and the output from an R Studio uh, 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 or Quarto document. Okay, so let's start with the basic uh, principles of ggplot2 and ggplot2. 
has uh, a basic philosophy behind it because there are a lot of uh, graphic packages in R. Um, and these graphic packages are, for example, base, lattice, trellis, and so on. But ggplot2 is the most powerful at the end of the day. And it's, uh, I think, the, 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 the go-to package if you want to do fancy visualizations as I, I showed to you. Um, the next advantage of ggplot2 is that it's part of the tidyverse universe where a lot of packages with a similar philosophy and a similar grammar are put together. So you cannot, uh, by, by, by using ggplot2, you can also use, for example, the deeply package that allows you to do data manipulation or data wrangling that is very essential, and I will show it to you later, for uh, visualization. So you combine packages that are meant to, uh, uh, or that are uh, designed to work together and, and um, it's part of the basic philosophy. And this ggplot2 is based on the idea of Gramov graphics, which uh, was first uh, discussed by Wilkinson, but also uh, Hadley Wickham wrote a paper about it. And it's um, a philosophy that has to do, uh, or as Wickham defined it, a Gramov graphics is a tool that enables us to concisely describe the components of graphic. Such a grammar allows us to move beyond the named graphics so we don't talk about the scatterplot and gain insights into the deep structure that underlines um, a graphics. And according to this grammar of graphics, graphs are objects that consist of, sorry, that consist basically of three different layers. That is, it consists of geometric objects, it consists of scales and um, a coordinate systems, and it consists of annotations. And the basic art of doing visualizations is bringing these elements together. So printing geometric objects, give them some, uh, put them on a coordinate system and, and working with scales, and then uh, uh, add some annotations in order to increase the readability of this graph. A ggplot2 graph is basically a layered uh, graphic because at the end of the day, the plot consists of data, and it consists of mapping. So you need to have data and you give this data certain um, a certain mapping and mappings consist of five elements. And as you will see here, some of these elements are printed in bold font uh, and I did so because these bold fonts are uh, the function names in ggplot2 that you will see later on. So basically um, there is a layer. So it's, it's a collection of geometric elements geoms and statistical transformations, dots, and uh, these geoms are points, are lines, and so on. And these dots are, for example, uh, uh, countings or binnings. For example, if you do a histogram, you have to tell uh, the computer how broad these bins should be. So it's basically a statistical information. You add some scales to this graph because you want to display certain values by giving them a certain color, a certain shape, a certain size, and you add, you add some axes. You have a coordination system, um, um, a, coordinate, uh, a coordination system, and you maybe want to split up your data into subsets. I was talking about the spaghetti chart, and sometimes it's, it's, it's much wiser not to use one chart, but to use two or three charts in order to, to make uh, things better readable and to get rid of spaghetti charts. And of course, there's a theme at the end of the day. It's basically the main design of the of the of the uh, plots. It's 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 about fonts. It's about background colors, and that's these five elements will be the elements we will talk about uh, uh, in detail when I show you the example. So again, uh, a plot is nothing. Uh, is is basically data combined with a certain mappings, and the mappings are layers, scales, code, uh, uh, coordination system, um, sometimes facets, and uh, as uh, a theme. So how does a basic ggplot plot look like? And it's um, quite easy to do it. Uh, ggplot2 code consists of three components. You have to tell uh, the function, what is your data? What mappings do you want to use? And what geom functions you want to use? That's it. And as you can see here, I, I um, with this code, and um, as you can see here in this presentation afterwards, you can copy and paste this 
code by just clicking on this element here. So if you want to test it later on, on your R Studio or, or Jupyter installation, just use this, this code for, uh, um, for, for, for copy and pasting. And as you can see here, the first thing I have to do, I have to load the package. And I'm, I'm not just loading ggplot2 package, I'm loading the tidyverse package. In order to load the package, you have to install the package in the first place. But let's say, okay, we've already installed it. Then we load the package. And I'm one of those guys who, who do not use the library uh, function to load a package, but uh, require uh, um, 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 function. But it's, that's another topic, OK? And then we need, we use the ggplot function uh, and say, OK, use the data sets. And I use a, a data set built in ggplot2 or the tidyverse package. That's the Star Wars uh, data set, um, um, which gives some, some, some basic elements or basic characteristics of the main characters of Star Wars. So uh, R2D2 um, um, or, or um, 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 Darth Vader and so on. And then I say, OK, the mapping is as follows. Please, uh, or the mapping is done with the uh, um, um, uh, option aesthetics. You say, OK, on the x axis, please uh, print the height of people. On the y axis, print the mass, so the weight of people. And then and that's important by adding a plus, you can add uh, elements to the graph. And in, and, and in this case, we say, OK, please make points. So it's a, it's a scatter plot. And um, the, 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 the function for doing it is geom underline point. Okay? So basically, I say, OK, please use the Star Wars data set. On the x-axis, print the height of people. On the y-axis, print the mass of people and do it by using points, so uh, GM point. And that's the result, as you can see here, we have the height, we have the mass, and uh, we have the points. As you can see here, there's a, there's a huge outlier, uh, uh, a character that is not that big, but um, um, heavy, heavy weighted. Don't know who, who it is, okay? Uh, let's go on. Let's make things a little bit more complicated or a little bit more uh, um, 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 difficult. Um, or more, more complex. As I told you, it's not just about uh, our ggplot is part of the tidyverse package. So you cannot just plot things. You can also combine it with other uh, package uh, functions like the filter function of the deeply package because data never comes the right way for doing visualization. So the first step for visualizations is bring the data into the right uh, uh, shape. And in this case, for example, we do not want to have um, this uh, kind of, of, of uh, visualizations with the outlier, but we want to get rid of this outlier. And we do so by filtering all observations uh, and just take the observations that have a mass smaller than 500. So we, so, we, so we get rid of this outlier and then say, okay, let's plot it um, again. Uh, and we plot the height and the mass and add an additional element that's gender. So it's a third variable. It's not just height on the x-axis and uh, mass on the y-axis, but add an additional uh, variable and it, uh, that's uh, gender in this case. And then again, use the plus and the geom point. And as we can see here, we have a plot where we have uh, uh, um, 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 very nice um, graph where you can see in Star Wars, there are certain masculine characters that are small and uh, with uh, less mass. Then we have, which is somehow natural, uh, men or masculine characters that are tall and heavy and women somewhere in between, okay? As you can see here, I did not use X um, equals height and y equals mass, because this function uses the first argument as the x argument and the second argument as the y argument. Okay, so we can we can omit the x and the y, something we defined here, this x and this y, because the first two arguments are always the arguments for x and y. Okay, but uh, uh, this color argument to use gender for for uh, colorizing the, the 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 points we have of course to define because there are other elements too. Yeah, okay, good. We can also make things more complex, not just by uh, uh, um, or using this plus element. So 
it's the same chart as we can see here, where we say, okay, we want to plot the Star Wars data set and want to plot gender on the X axis and uh, height on the Y axis. And we want to have a violin plot to display the distribution of data. Violin plots are a nice form to plot the distribution of data. Um, and we add a second uh, way of um, showing data. We use the geom jitter, which is basically a special form of geom point. And I will talk about geom jitter later. So I will not go into detail here and say, okay, use the, uh, for this points, use this color. So I defined the, the color as a hexadecimal code and uh, make it transparent. That's the way. Uh, um, that's uh, the reason why I use alpha. Uh, 0.5 means um, uh, use a 50% transparency, plus use another theme. And there's a, There are some built-in themes, and one of the themes that is uh, looking nice that reduces the clutter is the theme minimal. We'll use this theme later on also. So as you can see here, it's, there's much less noise. Okay, there's no background color. The grid system is not that uh, um, um, dominant as, as in um, this case. And we have two different sorts of geoms plotted, a violin plot and a geom jitter plot on this violin plot. And that's a very important thing because if you turn around these uh, this, um, uh, functions, if you start with geom jitter and then you plot geom violin, the geom violin will overplot the geom points. So it's always the thing you, 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 you use first is printed first, and then the other thing is printed uh, above the, 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 the one before. So always think about what's the right um, uh, sequence of elements you want to print. Okay? So maybe try it uh, later on. If you just swap these two elements, you will see at the end of the day that the violin plot somehow overplots those those points here. The other ones, of course, will, uh, you can see you, you can still see, but there's some sort of overplotting here. Okay, so that's basically that's basically uh, the, the the basic concept of ggplot2. And now let's use this knowledge uh, and do a graph. And that's, that's the reason why people are here in the first place. Are there any questions, Julia? No. Okay. So let us use now this theoretical knowledge and uh, uh, what we've learned about the process of visualizations and use the know-how of ChichiPlot 2 to uh, uh, do a nice graph at the end of the day. And I hope it's a nice graph. It's a graph you can, of course, make better, but, but I think it's a, it's a good first step in, uh, for, for a nice graph. And let's use these phases I was talking about. And the first phase is uh, the concept phase. So at the beginning, there's always the need for research interest. Uh, 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 and I'm use here a hypothetical example because um, I did not come up with a research interest and then thought about the graph, but I was uh, looking for a graph and then uh, 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 thought about the concept that, that, that would fit to this graph um, for this webinar. And um, let's say we have the, this research question of how tolerant has Austrian society become over time? So we want to look at, 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 at Austrian society and ask the questions, has Austrian society become more liberal or more, more conservative over time? So it's some uh, question about the, the, the change of, of attitudes over time. And there's, of course, the question of how can we measure tolerance? And there are a lot of ways to measure tolerance. But in this case, uh, uh, for this research project, we do not go into the field and, and, and measure tolerance. We go to a data set that is already available at AUSTA, and it's the European Value Study data set uh, um, um, with a special focus on Austria that somehow um, uh, combines the attitudes or, or, or combines four waves of, of um, uh, um, uh, surveys um, that covers somehow the, 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 the attitudes of Austrians towards a different number of social values. Basically, here you can see the the the, um, 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 the how did the data set looks at Austa, and please have a look at this at this data set by just clicking on this link here. This data is something you have to uh, get into. You have to dive into this 
data. And the best way to do it is having a look at the uh, certain uh, at the different uh, files in this data set. As you can see here, there are 10 files within this data set here. Um, if you learn more about the, the, the syntax of files in, in Austa, you can see here, you can see here, okay, that's a data set um, uh, with a certain number and the CO, CO means it's the code book and EN means it's the English uh, code book version one, okay, for example. But to get to know more about, about this um, uh, data set, have a look at the, at the questionnaire. And as you can see here, the questionnaire again has the number of the data set, Q, uh, U is the, is the abbreviation for the data set and EN for English. And um, having a look at this uh, questionnaire, you, you can see a lot of different cards with different questions people were asked. And uh, card number 44, is one that somehow covers basic attitudes towards contested societal questions, for example. It's about how do people stand towards abortion, towards uh, divorce, towards suicide, and so on. And uh, it somehow allows us to give, uh, to, ha to have some, some insights into the question of are people more liberal on these questions or are they more conservative? And I choose one of these elements, and that's the the, the, the um, variable uh, about homosexuality. So do people think that homosexuality, homosexuality is justified, never justified or something in between? And I want to look at how this question has developed over time. So the next thing I have to do is not just having a look at the questionnaire, but also having a look at the code book for these um, uh, variables. Because if I want to work with these variables, I have to know uh, what um, um, how these variables are are named within the data set, and that's uh, the thing um, you will find in the code book. There's a slight problem here, and it's something I discovered in doing this graph because I was using the code book and I didn't realize because uh, that's uh, an old code book online, and the newest version of the code book is not in the code book file but in the methods report file. So sometimes you really have to check all the files to, uh, in order to, to, to get the uh, information you need. And here I collected three variables for doing this graph. The one variable is the variable uh, um, um, about the question of uh, whether homosexuality is uh, justifiable. And as you can see here, that's a, um, a screenshot from the code book, is that the variable is homosexuality justifiable has the number F118. So it's the variable 118 that we need to use. Then we want to have a look at the, at the, at the changes towards this attitude, uh, towards this variable of people over time. So we need a, a, a time variable. And the, the, the variable that, 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 that's, in, um, that's used here is, 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 is the wave. So um, they conducted four waves of uh, survey in 1990, in 1999, in 2008, and 2018. And this variable wave is uh, hidden in the data set with the variable S002EVS, European Value Survey. Okay, so we need the variable F118 and we need the variable S002EVS. And let's add a third variable. It's the variable about gender, and this variable is called sex here because it's 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 um, uh, coded um, 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 as either you're male or female. There's nothing in between in this data set. Um, that's the way they did it, and and um, this variable has the number of X001. Okay, and it's important to know because then when we when we when we do the visualizations. We need these three variables. So F118, we need this one, and we need the X001. Okay, so phase two is over. We have the data set. We know how this data works, how it's basically structured. And now let's talk about the editorial thing, the editorial thinking. So basically, um, what could we do? We could, for example, do a graph like this. Okay, as you can see here. That's the basic data at the end of the day, and the code for this data is in the appendix. That's not the final graph I want to show you today, but again, uh, uh, the code for this graph is in the uh, uh, appendix if you want to have a look at it. And as you can see here, uh, uh, Austrians have become more tolerant over time because 
um, in 1919, almost more than 80 percent were uh, believed that homosexuality is never justified. And this uh, 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 went down to, uh, let's say, a little bit between uh, over 25 towards 30 percent. And at the same time, people believing that it's always justified, this uh, 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 um, values increased until almost three fourths of Austrian society. So basically, um, Austrian society became more liberal over time. That's a quote, uh, or that's a, um, a, we could do this one. And as, as you can see here, I added some text here. I, 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 I added um, more or less fancy headline. I did not use a legend because I colorized the subtitle and so on. But let's talk about this later. That's, for example, uh, um, a graph you, you will find um, um, also in, um, on a website for, of Pew Research, which has a similar graph on the United States on a comparable data set. Okay? It's a line chart, and line charts are easy to read, and you can see here the changes over time. The problem here is you only see two out of 10 categories, because this category is, as, um, it's not just, it's always justified or never be justified, but there are eight categories in between. Never be, never be justified is one, always justified is 10, and there are eight possible uh, uh, other answers in between. So adding these other eight um, um, values, you get closer to, um, to a spaghetti chart, okay? But you lose information if you do not uh, um, also convey this element. And there's also another problem because if you do an ordered logistic regression on this topic and you focus not just on time, so did, did uh, things change over time, but it's also a significant change between uh, uh, um, uh, men and women, so between gender, you will see that there's uh, also gender has a significant effect on the question of, of change over time. And adding also gender would, would not only mean to add 10 lines here, but 10 uh, time, uh, times two um, 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 uh, lines. And then we, are, we have 20 lines and we are very, very close to a spaghetti chart. And again, we do not show all the data at the end of the day. Okay? So let's think about let's think about the graph where we uh, uh, um, somehow convey the main message, where we show people the data, and where we also add this 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 uh, variable of gender and show people that there is a difference between when men and women when it comes to uh, 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 being open-minded or more tolerant over time. And that's here where we are in phase four, and I'm going to show you the whole. Uh, script for the final uh, graph that will be the surprise at the end, okay? So the first thing we have to do, we have to uh, configure our session. And I really like to use the Pac-Man package. It's something you have to first install and then load it because the Pac-Man package is a package for uh, package management tool. Uh, it allows you to use then, uh, um, if you have loaded it, you can use the pload function afterwards and just mention the package, the packages you need at the end of the day. And what Pilot then does is uh, really nice. It loads the package you require, but if the package is not, not installed, it installs the package and then loads it. So you just have one function, Pilot, in order to install and then load the packages you need in this case. Of course, I've already installed them in the first place, but uh, when you do this one, uh, you will see that there will be an uh, automatic installation before they load these packages. I use here uh, six different packages for doing this graph. I'm going to explain to you shortly what these packages are. It's a tidyverse package containing uh, uh, comprising ggplot2 for doing the graph and the diplia package for handling the data. It's a show text package for using non-standard extra fonts in the graph, because we use nicer fonts than the or, uh, original Arial font. We use Cairo. Cairo is a, a package that allows you to embed these fonts in the final graph. Because if you do not use Cairo, if you just save it, it will happen that, that, that you lose the nice fonts you will see in ggplot2 uh, or, or in our studio, but it will not be in the final PDF. 
we use uh, the GG text package for making titles and subtitles more fancy for coloring uh, 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 certain elements. That allows you basically to use Markdown and HTML in the um, title. And in this case, we also have to use the SG labeled package because the data set we're using is an SPSS label, uh, uh, SPSS data set, total nightmare to be honest, but uh, um, that's the way it is. So um, um, I have to use this one. And I use the Dataverse package in order to get access to the data from OSTA Dataverse. Okay, so that's the basic configuration I need in order to make things uh, 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 um, work. Then we have to load and tidy the data. And of course, I could make things very easy and just download it from, from Alsta and then uh, use uh, uh, read, um, um, uh, uh, a read function of, 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 of any of these packages. But in order to make things more reproducible, I use the get data frame function from this Dataverse package that makes this whole uh, example more reproducible at the end of the day. In order to do so, I have to define uh, a key, which is uh, um, 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 documented in, 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 in the, in the uh, documentation of this package. Of course, my key is not uh, X, Y, Z. Uh, there's another key, but I, I will not show you my uh, unique key. So you have to go to the Austa website, uh, um, register there, and then you will get a, a, a Dataverse key. And then you can just download uh, files from Austa by uh, giving the file name. You will find it in, in, in the repository by giving the uh, DOI, by telling R or, or this function, which um, uh, function you want to use for reading the file, because it, it's an SPSS tab file, we have to use the read DTA function and just say uh, uh, um, use the original data and 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 the link towards the server, and then we have um, this data set saved into the uh, object DF uh, underline EVS. Okay, it just saves this data set in this object. It's a data set with. Uh, I think uh, 600 um, uh, or more variables and, and um, uh, several thousand observations. But again, we just need three variables to do our graph. And so we do a subset, which we select only uh, the variable uh, of the wave of sex and of homosexuality. And we not just select them, we also rename them. Okay, so we do it in one step. We say, okay, make, make a new object from the DF EVS data set and select uh, this variable and call it year, select this variable and call it sex and uh, select this variable and uh, call it homosexuality, just in order to, to make things nicer and easier to handle afterwards. And that's the final result, okay? If we just print the first six lines of this data set, you can see here, okay, we have a year variable, we have a sex variable, and we have a homosexuality variable. Um, Normally, uh, it would uh, be displayed in a different way, but that's the SPSS way to do it, uh, which, 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 yeah, um, I will show you the problem and the solution towards this problem. So we have the configuration, we have loaded all the packages, and we have uh, loaded the data set, and we have uh, made a subset of this data set by selecting the three variables that we need in order to do the graph. And let's make the first step towards this graph make a very, very simple graph. And as you can see here, we use the data set, we use the pipe function to say, okay, from this data set, group the variables years, uh, sex and year, and then do a, uh, a Chi-Chi plot where you do on the x-axis the year, on the y-axis the homosexuality. I should get a, uh, rid of this comma, it's not necessary here, so, sorry. And then add some points. That's not a very nice graph or several uh, uh, reasons because by using geom point we have some overplotting. Okay, as you can see here, there are uh, several thousand observations, and every observation that 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 uh, has in the first wave, um, uh, I think that's the value one, never justified. And there, are, if there are five thousand or two thousand observations in this year for this uh, uh, category. There are uh, ggplot points, uh, uh, prints this point 
2,000 times over each other. We basically don't see how this whole uh, um, um, uh, distribution looks like because GG point, GM point always uh, uh, prints the same point on the same point, on the same point, on the same point, okay? That's not a good idea. In addition, as you can see here, the labeling of the axis is not really nice because what's two, what's three, what's four, what's five here, uh, it's mentioned that it's, it's years, but it's basically the factor variables of uh, the year variable. It's not 1999 uh, or 1990, 1998, 2018, 2018. And here on the y-axis, we have the, the, uh, uh, the Likert scale from one to 10, but it's, uh, um, we don't know if this one is always justified or never justified. And we have um, a theme that has a lot of clutter, a lot of uh, grid lines and a lot of color in um, the back. So let's go one step further and improve this graph by doing this one. We, this, this one stays, stays the same. We want to have a graph where we focus on the groups of uh, 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 sex and year. But what we use here is, and that's what I was talking about, uh, the SPSS data set. In this case, we have to use the S label function to print the year, not as, as um, uh, with the factors, but to print them in uh, with 1990, 1999, and 2008, and 2018, and the same for homosexuality. So um, not just one to 10, but uh, to, to um, uh, indicate that one is never justifiable, always justifiable is 10, and there's in between. And we colorize the sex. As you can see here, the, the, the um, red points are the males, and the um, uh, females are the um, blue points. And in order to not overplot these uh, GM points, I do not use GM point, but GM jitter. Okay, that was, uh, it's the same function we used before with the violin plot. Um, GM jitter plots points and, and takes care that it, these points are not overplotted. So it's not a, 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 an exact um, um, representation of the data, but in this case, we, it's, it's, it's not so important because as we can see here, it's very easy to distinguish points in, 90, in the column of 1990 or points in the column of 1999. And we use the theme minimal in order to reduce the clutter. But again, it's uh, uh, not good yet because now the axis label are somehow looking strange. They're not uh, looking nice. The colors are not really beautiful. And when we, when, when we talk about color blindness, that's a red that could be troublesome and even a blue for some kind of people. And we have a legend. And as I told you, we, sh we should avoid the legend at the end of the day. So. Let's go on and let's do a third step. In this step, I show you the graph later on, but what we what did, uh, did I do here? What I did is, uh, and I did it with a purpose, I not just uh, uh, programmed this um, uh, plot, I also saved it in a new object. So you can save plots in objects, and then I printed this object here by just uh, uh, calling it. So it's the object P, and then I call please print P, and that's the result of it, okay? I will come to this soon. What I did here is I want to get rid of, as you can see here, there's also the non-available data. Non-available data, I'm not interested in this non-available data. So the first thing I do is I use the data, frame, uh, uh, the data set, and I filter all data. Uh, um, I use all data except the data that is not available. So I check is homosexuality is there is not available and by using the exclamation mark I I I, I uh, use the opposite of it so all data except the non-available data I group it by years and sex and I'm uh, add a new variable mutate means to add a new vari variable and I call this new variable mean homosexuality I'm going to explain to you why and that means uh, it calculates the mean of the variable homosexuality, it can only do so if, if, if you say, please remove the non-available, true, which we already did before, but okay. And then use this data to plot the year and uh, homosexuality. So on the 
x-axis the year, on the y-axis the homosexuality, and uh, or the attitudes towards homo homosexuality, and then colorize these data sets, this data according to sex. And I say in the uh, or with the next function, I tell ggplot, okay, use not the standard color, but use manually defined colors. And these values are this one for the males, that's a blue, and this one for the women, that's a certain kind of yellow. And then add geomjitta, but use a certain amount of transparency. So only 30% of the original color, as you can see here, that uh, um, as you can see here, there's a, um, um, uh, GMGT not only takes care of overplotting, it also allows you by, by, by this uh, um, transparency to make things even more uh, um, uh, or better observable. And then I add another geom, a geom point, using on the y-axis the mean homosexuality and polarize it according to uh, sex. These are these points. So basically, I'm not just plotting the data as such, but I calculated for every year the mean uh, of all observations between men and women. So yellow are the mean of women and blue are the mean of men. And I, uh, um, what I like here, I plot two kinds of points. A bigger point, as you can see here, with the color of male and female, that's blue and yellow. And then I print another one, a smaller one, the size two, with white over it. So it, uh, um, that this point is, is, is uh, 40 views, a uh, yellow point or a blue point with a um, uh, white center, okay? And as you can see here, the same principle of overblotting because I first print the big one and then I print the smaller one. When I do it otherwise, the white smaller point would be overplotted by the, by the uh, uh, bigger colorized plots, okay? And then I say, okay, get rid of the uh, axis labels because these are years that's quite understandable. And these are the Likert scale, which is also, uh, uh, there's no need to explain it. Especially not if we use uh, um, if we use um, um, title at the end of the day, and again use the theme minimal. Okay, that's not the final graph. The final graph is this one, and I'm gonna show you the um, the code, and then I'm gonna show you the final the final uh, graph at the, at, at the end of the day. What I use in the final graph is I use different fonts. For example, the Economist uses uh, um, 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 a certain font, and and for uh, explanations and subtitled title, it uses the condensed version of this font. The same thing I do here. I use an, an openly available font uh, uh, from Google Fonts, and you have to have this uh, font installed on your on your computer. Okay, so go to 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 the Google Fonts web websites and download the. Uh, fonts you need. In this case, it's Roboto and Roboto Condensed. And I uh, um, um, create two objects, Font Family 1 and Font Family 2. Font Family 1 is uh, Roboto, Font Family 2 is Condensed. And then I use this P, this, L, this object before, that's this one, okay? and add to this P another uh, 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 option by using the plus, it's the same principle I use here, okay? ggplot plus this element, plus this element, and so on. The same thing I do here. I have saved all these elements in this object, and I add additional object. Here, I add a title, and I'm gonna explain to you shortly why this title has some HTML code within it, okay? I have a subtitle, and it is, uh, um, so the title is the fancy title, the subtitle is the question and the explanation. I use a caption at the end. So I tell viewers, okay, this data comes from the following source, okay? And then I say, please, uh, uh, ggplot2, use in the theme, uh, for the text, use a size of 14 and use the font family one, okay? For the title, again, font family one, for the plot title font family one, for the subtitle font family two, and do a little bit of uh, uh, um, um, intent the, the subtitle. Therefore, I use this margin argument of ggplot2. Uh, so bring it a little bit more to the right side. 
Then the access text should also have the size of 12 with the font family one, here the font family one, and the plot caption um, text should be size 10, font family one, but color dark gray. And then in the last element, I say, okay, please make this title and make all other elements, at least these elements, so the title, the subtitle, and the caption, a markdown element. Markdown element means that I can use um, HTML for giving the text additional, um, additional uh, uh, um, uh, features. Here, as you can see here, in the title, and I just used this uh, HTML element for the title, uh, I say, okay, the whole title should be bold. And therefore, I use this HTML tag for bold. So I open the tag and I close this tag. And everything in between this uh, bold um, um, caption and the uh, uh, closing of the bold caption will be printed bold, as we can see here. And then I use a color that's uh, HTML code for uh, um, styling text. And I say, OK, use this uh, color. Uh, that's the color of women to make the word women yellow. And I have, have to close it again. And then, um, OK, here should, yeah. And, and, and then open a new tag with another color for men to make men uh, in a different color, OK? You can see the result very, very soon, and you, we can talk about it later. And the last element I add, I say, OK, get rid of the legend. So legend position none means get rid of the legend. At the end of the day, you see this graph. Okay? Let's make it a little bit bigger. As you can see here, we have a title, Austrian women lead the way for men towards more tolerance. So that's the kitchen title. Here we have in the subtitle, basically the explainer telling us what was the exact question. We have the caption here, down here. So the source, it's it's not that important. So uh, I, I, I made it dark gray and a little bit smaller. And I we have here the year. We have here the Likert scale. And as you can see here, basically, by just looking at it, things have changed drastically. What we have seen in the first graph in this line graph. So most data in 1990 gathered here but never justifiable. And in 2018, things have changed drastically. It's somehow mirroring. So people are moving from uh, from 1 to 10 over time, as you can see here. And by plotting here this mean, and you can also see it if you, if you have a closer look at the raw data, the ones who, who travels faster and who travel first are women. So it's women that slowly move upwards from 1 to 10 over time and men follow too, okay? So basically, that's a chart where you can show people, okay, Austrian society has changed, it, it, it has changed over time, um, and, 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 and the, the, the first uh, who made this change were women, and men followed with their attitudes over time, okay? So that's just one way of doing it. I have saved the final plot here, with the, the code for the final plot, and what I've done here, I also added a code for saving this plot. I told you uh, we need the Cairo pa package for including the fonts into the final PDF, and that's that's the that's the that's the uh, function we use here. We use the PNG function and explain, okay, save uh, the final plot here in this folder and give it this name. That's the width and the height and the units. That's the resolution. 300 resolution means you can print it easily. Use the background color white. That's basically uh, this hexadecimal uh, code. And use the Cairo PNG uh, um, 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 pipe in order to embed it. Here is the whole um, code for, for uh, the graph. And you close it with dev off. That means after you wrote dev off, everything you opened here is closed here and saved into this final uh, um, graph. So that's it, basically. One minute to go. Uh, that's about that's the bibliography. So if you want to 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 get into uh, these different topics, please check it. And again, the book of Jonathan Schwabisch and um, uh, Hadley Wickham, I really recommend it to you.
um, uh, some hints of upcoming events. We will do next week a two-day workshop. It's also done by me about reproducible science and repro in open science and reproducible research in our studio and two Python notebooks. So basically we show you how to do, uh, how to make your research more reproducible. And there will be a hackathon on uh, visualization of research data. So basically what we've done today, there will be a hackathon on the 3rd until the 5th of December. If you're interested uh, um, um, in this hackathon, please register.